Okay, our uh, next session. Do it. Yeah, you can just go Okay, I'm starting. Was that too loud? <laughs> okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Robbie Wido, and I'm a member of the SSGAC and a uh, fourth year graduate student at the University of Colorado, uh, Boulder. At CU, I'm both a student in the Department of Sociology and in the Institute for Behavioral Genetics, and I'm very, very excited uh, to be sharing the prediction section uh, from the SSGAC's new GWAS of Educational Attainment. Before I get started, I wanted to just mention the main collaborators on this GWAS project. Uh, the four names you see there in bold, David Cesarini, Isu Akbe, Kevin Tom, and myself, uh, were the four people that made up uh, the core team of the prediction section for this paper. Okay, so Isu just mentioned some practical considerations for polygenic score construction. I don't want to go back over all of those because this is primarily meant to be a results-driven uh, talk, but I just wanted to mention that the scores constructed here are constructed using LDPRED. Uh, EA3 has two prediction samples. Uh, the first one is Ad Health. Thanks so much to Kathy Harris for giving us early access, uh, and also the Health and Retirement Study. And finally, as Isu mentioned, we're interested here in being able to make more fair comparisons uh, between our two prediction samples. So our polygenic scores will be constructed uh, by imputing our data sets and then using HapMap3 SNPs to, to construct the scores. We use HapMap3 again because they're known to be reliably well imputed. So just a few basic descriptive statistics that are important to this analysis. First, in line with modern demographic trends in educational attainment, we see a higher mean years of completed education in ad health as compared to HRS. This is because the ad health respondents are younger, as we can see from a higher mean birth year in ad health compared to HRS. And finally, there are lots of ways to report polygenic prediction results. The gold standard in the SSGAC, and one I'm sure you're all familiar with, is the incremental R-squared or the change in R-squared. This involves a very simple two-step process. In the first step, we regress our phenotype of interest on our control set of variables without our polygenic score. And then in the second step, we rerun the same regression, but this time we include the polygenic score. So for quanti or quantitative phenotypes like educational attainment uh, that you'll see in this talk, the measure of predictive power is this incremental R squared from the augmented regression that I've just explained. For binary phenotypes, because we're using probit regressions, we'll be reporting the, the change in the pseudo R squared. And finally, um, all 95% confidence intervals around incremental R squared values you see in this talk uh, will be bootstrapped with 1,000 repetitions each. So what does the current meta-analysis of educational attainment look like? Here's our Manhattan plot. <laughs> so you can see, in comparison to EA2, and especially in comparison uh, to EA1, we have far more lead SNPs than we've ever had before. We currently have 529 lead SNPs with a sample size of 768,819 individuals, making this one of the largest uh, GWAS meta-analyses ever done to date. And just a reminder that with the impending release of the UK Biobank data, we expect to have over a million individuals in our, in our publication GWAS. Okay, so I wanted to talk just very briefly about predictive power of polygenic scores. And in order to do this, I'll introduce a formula that was derived in 2008 by Detweiler. Uh, and it essentially allows us to estimate uh, the expected uh, predictive power of a polygenic score. Um, as you can see uh, in the formula, uh, it's sort of contingent on the SNP-based heritability of the phenotype of interest, as well as the sample size of the GWAS that we use to estimate the scores. And finally, here's a population parameter uh, that gives essentially the effective number of SNPs evaluated in the prediction cohort. We assume this to be about 70,000 in European ancestry individuals. 
So what do we predict, or what do we expect for our, uh, for our predictive power in EA3? Uh, so we'll use EA2 as a starting point. Uh, and we'll take the incremental R squared from EA2 at about 6.8% with the, uh, with the uh, discovery plus replication n size of about 405,000 individuals. And we'll plug that into the, to the Detweiler formula and find that we need a SNP-based heritability of educational attainment of about 1 point, er, 0.1476. And then if we take this SNP-based heritability and we plug it back into the Detweiler formula with our new sample size of about 769,000 people, we see that for the current meta-analysis, we should expect an incremental R squared of about 9.13%. Uh, so how are we doing now in EA3? <laughs> So we're happy to report that our incremental R squared for the health and retirement study is pretty close to what we should expect with the, with the Detweiler formula. The incremental R squared is about 9.22%. And now in Ad Health, um, we're doing even better than the Detweiler formula might, uh, might, might predict. The incremental R squared is 10.81%. Uh, making, making these polygenic predictions some of the strongest performed to date. If you're interested in differences between what we might expect from Detweiler and what we actually get, uh, that will be the, talk, or the focus of the next talk uh, by Megan Zacker. In the prediction section of EA3, we're also interested in other phenotypes, especially phenotypes that are related to educational attainment and also phenotypes that are related to cognition. <laughs> So we'll begin uh, with educational phenotypes that are available in both data sets. So we considered three indicator variables that were related to educational attainment. The first was high school completion, the second was college completion, and the third was grade retention, which is an indicator variable for whether students had ever repeat or repeated a grade or not. So on the x-axis, you can see these phenotypes. Uh, plotted against, this time, the incremental pseudo R squared. So in both prediction cohorts, the polygenic score is significantly predictive of all three outcomes. And for ease of visualization, at the bottom of each bar, I've included the value for the incremental pseudo R squared. So as you can see in the Ad Health data set, uh, depicted by the blue bars, for high school completion, our incremental pseudo R squared is 6.2%. For college completion is 8.2%. And for grade retention, the incremental pseudo R squared is about 4%. Uh, the, re the, com the comparable values are depicted by the gold bars for HRS. Uh, we can also look at the marginal effects here for a more meaningful interpretation. So for instance, a one standard deviation increase in our polygenic score is associated with a 4.2 percentage point increase in the probability of completing high school, a full 14.8 percentage point increase in the probability of completing college, and finally, uh, 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 a one standard deviation increase in the polygenic score is associated with a 7.1 percentage point reduction in the probability of repeating a grade. Again, here are the comparable uh, numbers for the HRS study. And taken as a whole, these estimates indicate that our polygenic score for educational attainment significantly predicts and explains a modest amount of the variation in variables that capture important educational transitions. Uh, here we also display a final interesting way to depict our results, this time for college completion. So first what we've done is we've divided our polygenic score into quintiles. So on the x-axis, the first quintile is indicative of individuals with a low polygenic score. And on the right side, uh, the fifth quintile is indicative of individuals with a high polygenic score. And then, and then on the y-axis, uh, I've simply graphed the mean prevalence of college completion in each quintile and for both data sets. So uh, though, uh, though inside of each quintile, uh, in, uh, the HRS respondents have a lower prevalence of college completion than the ad health respondents, as we might expect, for both data sets, we see a striking linear relationship between the quintile and the mean prevalence of college completion. In particular, the difference between the first quintile and the fifth quintile in the ad health data set is striking at about a 43% difference in college completion. And here's the comparable estimate for the HRS study. We're also interested in other education, uh, uh, education phenotypes and cognitive phenotypes that are unique uh, to either the ad health or HRS study. 
Uh, so uh, for the purposes of time, and also to keep the general interest of the audience, I'm not going to explain all of the, the details of the phenotypes. However, if you're interested in them, uh, I'm happy to go into them in the question time or after the talk. So in the ad health data set, uh, we have a measure of verbal cognition that is an augmented version of a cognitive test called the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. And also in ad health, in wave three, researchers collected transcripts uh, from the high schools of ad health respondents and calculated both the overall and some subject specific GPAs. So the blue bars here reflect these ad health specific variables, again with the incremental R squared values labeled at the bottom of the bars. So in ad health, the polygenic score is significantly predictive, again, of all of our cognitive and academic phenotypes. Uh, in our analyses of the Peabody test scores, we find an incremental R squared of about 6%. Uh, for overall GPA, the incremental R squared is about 8% and about 6 to 7% uh, for math, science, and verbal GPA. Next, across uh, eight different waves in the HRS data set, we have a measure of overall cognition and also a measure of verbal cognition. Uh, so we were interested, or, and we were also interested in evaluating wave-to-wave -wave changes in these total cognition and verbal cognition variables. And finally, in waves 10 and 11 of the HRS data set, we have an indicator variable equal to one for subjects who report ever having been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and zero otherwise. And our decision to include this last variable was motivated by evidence that educational attainment and Alzheimer's are modestly genetically correlated. Uh, so in HRS, which is depicted by the yellow bars, the PGS is again significantly predictive of total cognition and verbal cognition with incremental R squareds of about two and a half and 4%. However, our score was not uh, significantly associated with our measure of wave to wave changes in total cognition or verbal cognition or with our measure of Alzheimer's. So taken as a whole, these estimates indicate that the polygenic score for educational attainment significantly predicts and explains a modest amount of the variation in some crude measures of cognition and academic achievement. Uh, here's another interesting analysis that we did in the prediction section. So in both data sets, we created 22 individual polygenic scores for each of the chromosomes. On the x-axis, uh, you can see the chromosome length depicted in megabase pairs plotted against on the white or the y-axis, again, the incremental R squared for educational attainment. Uh, so in both data sets, you can see, as we might expect, a strong linear relationship uh, between chromosome length and the incremental R squared for the individual by chromosome polygenic scores. Uh, and we find the symmetry uh, in these two data sets to be, to be interesting. I also wanted to note uh, that by now, with our very high sample sizes in EA3, some of our longest chromosomes, chromosomes one, two, or three, together are explaining or, or are competing the incremental R squared uh, from the original polygenic score for educational attainment uh, back in 2013. Uh, in this final analysis, this time just using the ad health data, we sought to gauge the predictive power of our EA3 polygenic score against effects from variables that might be culprits uh, for also explaining a large amount of the variation in educational attainment. So I'll note that these analyses are preliminary and we plan on uh, doing a much better job for the, for the publication version of the paper, but we also thought that these preliminary analyses were interesting uh, and so we thought we'd share them with you. So as a reminder, the predictive power of our polygenic score is 10.8% in ad health. And we first proxy for socioeconomic status by using mother's education and calculate the incremental R squared for mother's education. Uh, and this incremental R squared is 14.4%. We next proxy for cognition by again using the, P the Peabody picture vocabulary test and calculate the incremental R squared for Peabody. And we find an incremental R squared of 13.6%. So taken together, this analysis indicates that even though socioeconomic status and cognition still explain a larger amount of the variation in educational attainment, uh, our score is now approaching the predictive power of some of these classically sociological or psychological variables. Okay, so some broad conclusions from the talk. First, the scores from EA3 are among the strongest polygenic predictors that have ever been constructed to date. 
Uh, despite these powerful scores, much of the heritability still remains missing, so there's plenty of good work still to be done. And finally, as larger samples are increasingly available to estimate weights for polygenic scores, their predictive power rises, and soon EA3 will have one of the first scores constructed using over a million individuals. I also wanted to note uh, my mentors, who have been very important to me and my work in graduate school. And thank you for your time. OK, so the, the next talk is by uh, Megan Zecker. Already loaded on here. Great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay. <coughs> Perfect. I'll try not to go over. Oh, Zachary, you sent it to me, right? I did. Yeah, this morning. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, oh, yeah, I have here. it on here. Perfect. Great. Awesome. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Megan Zacher, um, and today I'll be talking about another, pro another part of this project um, on educational attainment. So in this section of the paper, we've explored variation across data sets, which I'll be referring to as cohorts here, um, and the heritability and genetic correlation of educational attainment. So you might be wondering, why are we talking about heritability and genetic correlation at a conference about polygenic scores? Um, and that's a fair question, but I hope to convince you that they're relevant here. Um, so as you know, Robbie's just presented um, some really exciting results regarding the predictive power of this new polygenic score for education. And I'm sure many of you are eager to start using this score and others like it in your own research. And of course, one way um, to do that is to see how well it performs across different cohorts or in different subpopulations, <laughs> right? And before doing that, it's important to review what components actually factor into this predictive power. And it so happens that these components include heritability and genetic correlation. So as I'll show, differences um, in these factors um, allow the, the predictive power of a polygenic score to vary systematically across cohorts. And in some cases, this might be considered evidence of gene by environment interaction, which I imagine will be a fruitful topic of future research using this and other scores. So to get started, I'm going to go back to this Detweiler formula, which Robbie mentioned earlier. Um, and this formula says that the expected predictive power of a polygenic score is a function of the heritability of the phenotype, as well as this lambda term, which involves the sample size in the discovery cohort and the number of effective SNPs analyzed in the prediction cohort. Now, importantly, this formula makes at least two critical assumptions that we'll interrogate here. First, it assumes that the heritability of the phenotype is constant across cohorts. And this can be seen by the fact that there's no subscript on this heritability term in this formula. Second, it assumes that the relative effects of genes on the phenotype are also constant across cohorts, or in other words, that the genetic correlation of the phenotype is perfect when considering different pairs of cohorts. But of course, as we know from research on gene by environment interaction, these assumptions may not hold, right? Genetic effects are contingent on environments which may vary across cohorts. So in this derivation, these two assumptions have been relaxed, and here you can see that the expected predictive power of a polygenic score is a bit more complex. So here it's a function of the SNP heritability of the phenotype in the discovery cohort, which is um, the term with the D subscript there. And it's also, again, a function of lambda. But in this talk, I'm going to focus on these other two components um, of this formula, because those, these are the components that can vary across prediction cohorts and therefore drive variation in this predictive power. So um, as you can see, the expected predictive power of a polygenic score is higher in prediction cohorts for which the, um, the heritability of the phenotype is higher. And it declines when the relative genetic effects in the discovery and prediction cohorts are imperfectly correlated. Right? So the more imperfect this genetic correlation is, the weaker the expected predictive power of this polygenic score. So in light of these methodological motivations and this exciting new score for educational attainment, um, we sought to explore two questions. 
So first, we asked what cohort characteristics explain why the heritability of education differs across cohorts. And second, we asked what characteristics explain why the genetic correlation of education might differ across pairs of cohorts. And the first of these questions has already been explored in some prior research on gene by environment interactions. Um, for example, a 2013 paper by Brannigan, McCallum, and Fries um, meta analyzed twin studies um, and found that the heritability of education differed across countries and across birth cohorts. Um, so we looked to that paper for inspiration for this analysis and extended it in a few ways. So here I just have a quick roadmap for what we did because we used two kind of sets of analyses to answer these questions. Um, the first we explored across cohorts using GWAS summary statistics from 67 cohorts that provided data for this EA3 project. Um, and together these cohorts represent over 700,000 individuals, as Robbie mentioned. And then next, we followed up some of those results using individual le level data from a single cohort, which is the first release of the UK Biobank. So first, what cohort characteristics did we consider? Um, we considered four, which I have on this slide. The first is measured with the number of response options people could choose from when reporting their educational attainment to the survey um, that the cohort used. And the range of this variable is quite large. Some cohorts only provided four response options for people to choose from when reporting their educational attainment, and others provided up to 20. So the estimated heritability of education may be smaller within cohorts for which fewer response options were provided, as measurement error will just be bigger in those cohorts and attenuate these estimates. We don't really expect this um, accuracy or detail variable to affect genetic correlation. The other three variables that we used um, all reflect the institutional environment in which cohorts were embedded. So there have been dramatic changes over the past century in both educational systems and labor markets. Um, so average year of birth in a cohort is a rough proxy for the related institutional environments that cohorts faced. So prior work suggests that the heritability of educational attainment might have increased across birth cohorts, so the same may be true here. And we also accept, expect cohorts that differ in terms of average birth year might have imperfect genetic correlation of educational attainment as motivations for and requirements to advance through the educational system have changed over time. Um, the other two variables that we used um, have similar arguments. The first is a measure of the average educational attainment in the cohort's country in 1950, which is the earliest year for which this data was widely available. And the second is a measure of income concentration in the cohort's country in its average birth year. So this varies across countries and across time. And specifically, it's the share of income earned by the top 10%. So now that we had our variables, our initial plan was to estimate heritability and pairwise genetic correlation across all 67 of these cohorts and across all pairs of these 67 cohorts and then to use these estimates as dependent variables in regression analyses. Unfortunately, we hit a snag early on. Um, many of our cohorts are quite small. About a third of them have fewer than 1,000 people. Um, and so when we went to estimate heritability, many of those heritability estimates were negative, which meant the genetic correlations were completely inestimable in them. Um, and this was for about a third of the cohorts, so it's quite a substantial part of our data. Um, so our solution to get around this issue was to create these cohort profiles. So we dichotomized our four um, cohort characteristic variables um, at the sample size weighted medians across all of our cohorts. And then we meta-analyzed cohorts that fell onto the same side of the median for all four of these variables. All right. And so, um, so all the cohorts that had the same response profile were meta-analyzed together. So I know this is kind of a non-intuitive method, so just a quick example here. Um, I have data from three of the cohorts that we use, FAMHS, the UK Biobank, and the Health and Retirement Study here. And if you just have a look at the row for the UK Biobank, um, this indicates that they were coded as having above median, um, like an above median number of response options in their survey question about education, a below median average birth year, a below me median average education in the country, and below median income concentration within that cohort, right? 
And then for these other two cohorts, um, you can see that their response profile across these four dichotomous variables is identical, right? It's high, low, high, high. And so they were considered to ha have the same response profile and were then meta-analyzed together along with all the other cohorts that followed the same, um, the same pattern. All right, so with four binary variables, there were 16 possible profiles into which our cohorts could fall. Nine of these were actually realized in our data. So some patterns weren't found at all across our 67 cohorts. And once we meta-analyzed um, all the cohorts that fell into the profiles, our profile sample sizes ranged from about 3,000 to over 300,000. And so with sample sizes like this, we were able to actually estimate heritabilities and genetic correlations for all of the profiles and profile pairs. And we did this using LDSC. So the takeaway of this slide is just that there's actually quite a bit of variation in these estimates across our profiles and across our pairs of profiles. Um, so as you can see, the estimated heritability of education ranged from 0.063 to 0.205 with a mean around 0.13. Um, and the genetic correlation estimates ranged from 0.696 to 1.563 with a mean of about exactly one. Um, and I should point out here that um, obviously genetic correlation is actually bound by negative one and one, um, but estimated genetic correlation can fall outside of these bounds just like estimated heritability can be negative. Um, it's just the way that it's estimated. So this isn't, a, isn't an error. Um, so, uh, to study variation in the heritability of education across our profiles, we use weighted ordinary least squares linear regression with inverse variance weighting. Um, and the results of this analysis are presented here. So the dependent variable here is the estimated heritability of education in the profile. And the independent variables are these binary cohort characteristics that I described earlier. And the reference for all of these is low. So I'm just going to go through these one by one. So the intercept here indicates that the predicted heritability of education for a profile characterized by a few number of response options, by early average birth years, by low average education and low income concentration is significantly higher than zero, but it's quite low, it's 0.076, right? Then two of our cohort characteristics um, were estimated to have fairly small um, coefficients and they were in, um, not distinguishable from zero. Um, and this was later average birth year and income concentration. So I won't say more about those here. But profiles characterized by a high average education in the country appear to have somewhat higher heritability of education than those characterized by lower average education. This is a marginally significant result. And then lastly, um, the number of response options available for education in the cohort survey is significantly associated with the estimated heritability of education. Cohorts that provided more response options for people are estimated to have a higher heritability of education, which is what we expected at the outset. So now moving on to the genetic correlation analyses. Again, we use weighted ordinary least squares with inverse variance weighting. The dependent variable here is the estimated genetic correlation between a pair of profiles. Um, and the independent variables here are indicators of whether the two profiles under consideration match in terms of this binary variable, right? So it's a little different than the previous analysis. It's whether or not they match. Um, and so here, the intercept indicates that the predicted genetic correlation between profiles that are unmatched on all four of these variables that we considered is 0.894. And this is significantly higher than zero, but it's also significantly lower than one. So this estimate shows that this is a significantly imperfect predicted genetic correlation um, when none of these um, variables match. Three of our indicators of matching um, have fairly small estimated coefficients and are insignificant. But the one variable that really stands out um, is this indicator of whether or not the two profiles being considered match in terms of average year of birth, right? So this is only a marginally significant result. I think the p-value was like 0.095 or something like that. Um, but as you can see, the estimated coefficient is, is pretty sizable here. And this should be even clearer given this figure. 
Here I've plotted the predicted genetic correlations on the y-axis. The blue bar is just um, the intercept here. So it's the predicted genetic correlation when all four of our variables are unmatched. You can see it's 0.89. It's significantly below 1. The red bar then indicates the predicted genetic correlation when two profiles are matching just on this average year of birth variable. Right? So that brings this predicted genetic correlation up to nearly 1. It's 0.98. And then the green bar shows that once we take these other three variables into consideration, it doesn't really raise our estimated genetic correlation any higher. Right? So it's really this average year of birth variable that's mattering here. So to summarize, this cross-cohort analysis suggests that the number of response options and average educational attainment in a country are important for the estimated heritability of education. And though birth year didn't appear to be important for the heritability of education, um, whether or not cohorts match in terms of this average year of birth does appear to be important for relative genetic effects and genetic correlation. So um, the next question is, do these results hold up in other analyses? And we were fortunate enough to be able to follow up two of these results using data from the first release of the UK Biobank, um, for which we had access to individual level data. So first, um, we asked whether estimated heritability declines when a less detailed survey question is used for educational attainment. Right, That was our first result from that um, cross-cohort analysis. To answer this question, we created a simulated phenotype for educational attainment by condensing responses from the original six category survey item used um, in the UK Biobank to just three categories. Next, we estimated GWAS and both the original phenotype and the simulated one. And then we estimated the heritability for both of these phenotypes. And as you can see here, um, results are consistent with those of our earlier analysis. So here I've plotted the estimated heritabilities on the y-axis. The blue bar um, indicates the predicted heritability for this simulated phenotype that only allowed there to be three response options for educational attainment. Um, this is 0.13. And the red bar indicates the predicted um, heritability, or the estimated heritability, sorry, um, using this original phenotype, which used six survey options um, for educational attainment. And then second, um, we asked whether the estimated genetic correlation of education is imperfect across UK Biobank respondents born in earlier versus later years. So to do this, we first divided the respondents along the median birth year, which is 1951. Second, we estimated separate genome-wide association studies for education for the two subsamples. And then we estimated the genetic correlation between the resulting sets of summary statistics using LDSC. And again, um, here you can see that results are still consistent with those of our earlier analysis. So the blue bar here shows that the genetic correlation is estimated to be 0.92 across these two subsamples, one group that was born before 1951 and one group that was born afterwards. Though I should note that the confidence interval includes one. Um, as a point of comparison, we took these same steps for two additional phenotypes, uh, BMI and height, also in the UK Biobank. Um, and interestingly, the pattern found for educational attainment is present, but less pronounced when we consider BMI. So this genetic correlation between the two birth cohorts is 0.96. And when you consider height, it's almost a, perf it's a perfect genetic correlation of one. Um, so this is just kind of a neat demonstration that these results are really phenotype specific. Um, so the environmental conditions that lead to different relative genetic effects on a phenotype really depend on the phenotype under consideration. So in sum, uh, results show that the estimated heritability of education is higher when the accuracy or detail with which um, the phenotype is measured um, is higher. And the takeaway here is that accuracy or detail measures for the, or matters for the estimated heritability and therefore for the expected predictive power of a polygenic score. So if you're going to compare this predictive power across cohorts, the ideal situation is to estimate that phenotype the same way in the two cohorts that you're using. Our results also suggest that average education in a cohort's country is associated with heritability, such that cohorts from countries with higher average education evince higher heritability. 
And unfortunately, this result couldn't be followed up in the UK Biobank analysis, since the UK Biobank just contains a single country. Um, but this result is at least suggestive that the institutional environment matters for the heritability of education, which really should come as no surprise to many of the people in this room. And then finally, in both the cross-cohort and within cohort analyses, the estimated genetic correlation of education was imperfect when considering cohorts with different average birth years, right? So relative genetic effects appear to differ across birth cohorts for education. And a remaining question here regards the mechanisms driving this change, right? A lot has happened across birth cohorts. What is it that's responsible for this change? Um, and this would be a really interesting topic for future research. So lastly, this analysis tried to pinpoint some specific factors associated with the estimated heritability and genetic correlation of education. Um, and this is an important topic for users of this and other related polygenic scores um, because the performance of these scores depend on these factors. By extension, variance in the predictive power of a polygenic score may be evidence of some type of gene by environment interaction. Um, and researchers interested in this pathway forward may want to follow up on the specific components or mechanisms that are driving variation in this predictive power of their polygenic scores. So that's all I have. Thanks so much. And thanks to the people who collaborated. So we have mm -hmm. time for questions. Uh, Robbie, do you also want to maybe come to the podium? Yeah, so, so this is one of the problems with using this type of analysis is that we had to kind of dichotomize our cohorts along these lines. And so we're masking a lot of variance within cohorts that we just weren't able to explore here. It feels like that's a really critical problem because mm -hmm. if the average education within the population is very high, but there's very little variability around that versus mm -hmm. lower mean but much broader variability, that's where a lot of the genetic Sure. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, a potential area for a follow-up here. I wonder if there is. We didn't look into that for this initial analysis, but that would be a really interesting to study. Um, then using this individual level data, you'd still have variance in this educational attainment variable. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, Did you check the genetic correlation uh, with other traits like cognition in those born early in the century versus those born later? Do you see different profiles? Um, so, as I, I don't, maybe I this. Uh, sure, so the question was, um, did we check for other phenotypes, whether there's variation in this genetic correlation across cohorts, or birth cohorts, I should say. Is that, is that correct? Right, so to, to, to build the polygenic scoring, those born early and those born later, and you look across the phenotype spectrum. Yeah. So all we looked at here was this genetic correlation um, within the UK Biobank for these three phenotypes. Um, it would certainly be interesting to extend that to other phenotypes as well and actually use polygenic scores differently. Um, we haven't done that here, but that, that's a great follow-up. I think we have found it in the previous uh, section with our health of interest. Our health is a young group cohort, where interest is older. And how do the results compare for cognitive function? Uh, oh, you mean? For our health and interest results. So how, how did the scores compare for cognitive functioning? Uh, so so we're just looking at those slides. Um, where are they? So there is also variation. We were able to better predict cognition in the younger at health sample than we will compare. And that seems true across the different um, the different phenotypes that were done in the prediction section, right? Even for educational attainment, the R squared for ad health is 10.8%, mm -hmm. and for the HRS, it's like 9.2%. 9 9 yeah. yeah. So it, it seems like uh, 
you're, you're reporting R squared, but presumably there's a, there's a variance predicted by the genetic stuff, and then a, a variance predicted by the stuff that you can't pin down by the genetic stuff. And, mm -hmm. and some of this might be the greater variance in the other things. So think, think of the question about countries where there's a big variation in, in education. You might, you might just have that, that variance of the non-genetic stuff getting bigger rather than the variance of the genetic stuff getting any smaller. And, sure. and so I, I, think, I think there's a kind of this, this um, focusing in on the R squared may not mm. tell you the full story because a lot of these differences may be about sure. the variance of the not of the you know not so obviously genetic factors. Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Yeah. Sure. I don't know who's next. So. He's there. Hi, Robbie. You had interest in about mother's education and mm -hmm. cognition and. Genes. I wasn't quite sure whether those are just purely multivariate regression or other covariates can mean that we're not genetic covariates, but uh, so so um, mm. so the polygenic score is not included uh, in in those incremental R squareds. What I've done is I've I've simply estimated the incremental R squared first for mother's education mm. and then for cognition in the same way that we would uh, with the polygenic score. Um, and so what you have there are just incremental R squareds for adding in a mother's education to the control set of variables, and then for adding in cognition to the control set of variables. Have you tried any sort of multivariate growth methods when you put lots of things together and see how much things are taking? Oh, yeah. Um, so I have a slide on that. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, the, the question was, um, so, so you're interested in patterns of attenuation when we add in variables one at a time of our polygenic predictor? Yeah. Okay, so, so someone help me find my slides. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, how do we do this? Uh, okay, so, uh, so again, these are sort of preliminary analyses, and, and we plan on building in more common demographic characteristics like uh, marital status or something like income. So we have a sort, sort of more of a, of, of, of a, a standard set of, of variables that are available widely in data sets. Uh, but you can see here what I'm doing is I'm calculating the incremental R squared uh, as we start adding in sort of variables. Uh, and so we go all the way through where we include these two variables, mother's education and, and cognition, that we expect to, to uh, explain a lot of the, the variation uh, in educational attainment. And you can still see that we have an incremental R squared of about 3.5. 2% uh, here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which I think is, uh, is very interesting, but also perhaps even an argument that we soon will be able to maybe use uh, highly powered polygenic scores as control variables themselves uh, in data sets. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, Okay. So your result now is that the predictive accuracy of the score actually increases for, uh, for the younger cohorts? Whereas in EA2, we actually reported the opposite result in the Swedish Twin Registry, mm -hmm. right? So there we saw that the predictive accuracy actually went down sure. for the younger cohorts. So what's going on here? Yeah. So do you have thoughts? Yeah. So I guess I think it's interesting that it, what I think is interesting about this cross cohort analysis is that both have to factor in this heritability figure, right? How does that differ across these prediction cohorts? and think about what cohorts were actually included in the GWAS that constructed the weights for this polygenic score. So in this updated version of the score, right, we're using data from um, 23andMe, um, which is like a later cohort, um, like the average year of birth is much later in there. It's from the United States. Um, so I, and that's a huge cohort as well. So I would imagine that's kind of shifting the weights toward a certain group of people, perhaps. Um, Speculation, I don't know, yeah. I mean, when you're the um, different cohorts, they might be, they're, they're asking different questions. And, you know, that too. So it's not only taking into account perhaps differences in heritability, but, but I don't know, I guess it, there might be differences in heritability just due to differences in measurement error mm -hmm. um, in these two different cohorts. So you, you should be careful in interpreting that difference too strongly. Okay. Sorry, so, yeah. actually, yeah. Laura's, Laura's next. She's oh. been, I, I, oh. yeah. Hi, I'm Laura. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for these 
wonderful presentations, and your Manhattan plot is outstanding. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's really exciting, and you know, we're getting up to 10% of variance, and you had one slide that really hit me was college graduation mm -hmm. based on that. Mm -hmm. So we're really moving to the point where we may take action based on polygenic whisper. So I want to push Oh, that's uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is everyone afraid of it? If we're afraid of it, we shouldn't. We should leave. I, th I think <laughs> it's. <laughs> we are sitting here and we're generating this knowledge, and we cannot be afraid of it. And we have to think of what's going to happen. We are showing prediction of college graduation based on genes. Period. So, so I think um, so. I think there's a couple of important points here. Uh, the first one is that we're really not taking into account any sort of G by E effects, which we know are very important. Uh, but also, um, I think it's really important to remember in this type of work uh, that, that we're not really able to make any predictions uh, for individuals, right? And so like, and so like the power of the, of the polygenic score, um, especially in social science research, is that we're studying ag you know, population aggregated behaviors. So I think it's... It, at least for me, maybe not others in the audience, but it's hard to it's hard to imagine taking action still at this point. What should we do more for the people who are at that low end? Um, you mean like educational interventions or yeah. th those sort of things? I don't know. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's, it's kind of going back to what we were talking about before about just the differences in the cohort. So there's a lot of mortality selection. In HRS specifically, yeah. and Good point. the mother's education is missing, you know, as Lauren has, has found that that's missing disproportionately in the non-genetic sample in HRS mm -hmm. versus with the genetic sample. Mm -hmm. um, so how have you accounted for this mortality selection across your cohorts? Uh, we haven't. We haven't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I think I think we, uh, it's an important reminder that the research question that Megan and others asked mm -hmm. in that section is a hard research question to answer, and so we've done a very messy analysis. Uh, but but we've done what we what we thought was the best to try to try to answer the research question. So you know we may have picked different variables or or, or things right. like that. But um, so.
question. Yeah, I think I was going to mention, I think we need to understand the causality before we start making but also related to that, Robbie, um, when you looked at the association between your body's genetic score and cognitive functioning, did you adjust out education? Because I think an important thing is, is it really just education mediating that, or is it some type of biotrophy? Mm -hmm. I would think it's probably the former, since you didn't find anything for cognitive decline. And also this could explain why maybe the younger cohorts you're finding bigger effects before kind of other mechanisms like aging really affect the cognitive function. Mm -hmm. Uh, so did I adjust, did I, did I control for, uh, for one's own educational attainment? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Uh, no, we, we didn't do that, so, okay. so we probably should and see if anything changes. But one thing, at what age was this um, cognitive score measured in, Peabody thing measured in? Um, That's relevant too, right? If it like happened very early in life and the education happened. Too. I think Peabody was measured in wave one of ad health. Okay, Yeah. sure. <laughs> So they were still in school at like the time point, yes, I'm imagining. Sure. Mm -hmm. And it was, there was an association with positive score, mm -hmm. but that could just be education mediating that, and there was no association with change. Mm -hmm. Right, so. It's probably capturing more positive outside. Oh, right, mm -hmm. so, so we should do those analyses, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Sorry. Oh, so to, to, to address Laura's question, it seems like what you really want for, for doing, knowing what in, interventions to do is, is a GWAS of, of a treatment effect. And so these wouldn't be impossible to get necessarily, but they're difficult. But I think you need to start by saying, what's a treatment effect that we could, we could think that we could get in relation, you know, so you need, you need people who have the treatment and not sure. the treatment uh, in sure. a very large sample. But I think until you have a GWAS of something that's like a treatment effect, mm -hmm. you don't know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so in the, you found that uh, the heredibility went up in this more recent analysis with 23 mean, but in the older analysis it went down in the course, which has been generally the findings, I think, of other people who have looked sure. at the predictability of these scores across cohorts. Which mm -hmm. has been um, are you concerned about the fact that the 23 and sample is not nationally representative and might, in general, have a much larger sample of people who are more educated and that might be biasing the results that you're finding? Sure. Um, that's an excellent point. And again, goes back to this idea that we need to be thinking about who's actually contained in that GWAS, where these weights are estimated from. That's a really good point. And there's nothing really that we can do about that here since we don't have this individual level data. Um, from that cohort, but that's a great thing to keep in mind. Yeah. I have a question for uh, for Robbie. Um, so I was wondering about the well, interpretation of one of your results. So what you show is that the polygenic score for education doesn't affect the change in uh, the cognitive scores and so on. But I was wondering, like, basically this polygenic score is the additive combination of all of those SNPs. So how do you interpret this? Is this sort of evidence that we this additive scoring is a good thing? That there's no sort of effect on the change? Or is it actually just an artifact of the of the thing that well, because you constructed it in an additive way, there cannot be an effect on the change. So I was wondering about the implementation. Uh, is, is Kevin in the room for this? Kevin, yeah. do you wanna do you wanna take that question since you Why well, I don't I mean so I'm not quite sure why your expectation would be that if it's an estimated or additive way we wouldn't expect to see any effect on it. Cognition. Um, these are these are things that you know, just constructed for big education. It's not clear that, that they would predict changes over time. There's no inherent reason why you would expect that uh, to be true. It could be perfectly consistent with the world. There are different mechanisms um, that affect some kind of baseline cognition and then a rate of decline uh, over time. And, and it might be the case that the processes that affect the degradation of certain cognitive processes are governed by different um, by different biological processes. It could also be that we have a ton of measurement error in, in, uh, in, in bouncing around from wave to wave, and we're just not very well powered to detect that uh, either. But we're doing what we can do with that data, and I think there's a way to I would like to add that the whole idea of heritability of change in cognition is incredibly fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Differ dramatically depending on the phenotype that you're looking at, but also the modeling technique that you're using in order to try and capture change. So. 
you know, the fact that there was no direct prediction of change in cognition, I'm not necessarily surprised because yeah. there are, you know, numerous studies out there that don't find a significant variability in cognitive change. <coughs> How many of them different countries for their educational reforms? So, especially when splitting by the 1950 birth year, the UK, sure. 72, 73. Right. I, to be honest, I wouldn't know how many came from countries in which there were <laughs> educational reforms that happened across those time periods, but they are largely from like the US, the UK, um, Western, Northern European countries. So a lot of them, I would imagine, have experienced. There are educational reforms that they control for that. Oh, OK, great, cool. Jonathan? Yeah, just briefly, I wouldn't get too upset about not being able to predict cognitive decline in HRS. I'm the project scientist for HRS. I was mm -hmm. a cognitive psychologist by training. When I first saw the cognitive measures, the little part of me died. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, about 98% of me. <laughs> the, really, what you're seeing here is you're essentially seeing changes in the mostly delayed, in fact, recall on the battery. Mm -hmm. And in general, even with really good measurements with really excellent cognitive studies, predicting change is always harder than predicting the level at a given age, like a lot harder. So this doesn't surprise me at all. You get an impoverished period, it gets worse. But there is some good news, okay? In the next couple of years, you'll actually have access to all of the harmonized cognitive assessment protocol data on HRS, which is an hour-long cognitive battery that we're giving to 3,000 of people over age 65, and so then you'll really have you know, much nicer measures for a lot of these sub-constructs. You can actually ask the questions. And the way that they were able to ask for ad health, for example, in this study, albeit at age 65 or older, than, than here. And then you'll start to, I think, you'll really start to understand that maybe that there are aspects of cognitive ability that are more or less contributing, at least in HRS, to some of these things. But the funny thing is, is that one more point is that, again, how you do the analysis, what you're analyzing makes a big difference. So self reported Alzheimer's disease, again, we'll do better there. There's going to be actual, uh, you know, actual diagnoses. But frankly, in the Lang et al. paper published last November, you found, you know, like uh, educational attainment and SES wildly predictive of dementia, you know, prevalence, right? But that's because this, the model you tend to, to draw there is that, you know, how high you got during age, which, which does nicely, it's nicely which is one thing. The rate of decline in each nature is very close to parallel between people, and it's when you hit that threshold, all right? If it's a threshold model for dementia, then again, what you're going to get is you're going to get a walking effect, the VA and SES and all those fun things you like on the dementia diagnosis, and just depends on, you know, whether you live long enough. And on uh, the uh, it, it will be a lot harder to find. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question. This is lunch there. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question for the cohort study. Did you do the study in full stage? The first stage you analyze each cohort in cases. Uh, then your second stage you do a regression on this? Uh, that's right. So in the first stage, we like actually estimated these heritabilities yeah, in the profiles. And the second stage of regression, regression on those. Correct. So there's error in those estimates. The, uh, the, the methodology, the decision uh, made study, so investigated this, whether you can use entire individual data or sub-sample aggregate statistics and then do a regression. The conclusion, this was done like 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. the conclusion is that if you use the summary statistics to do the regression, ignoring the variability within each sample, you get mm -hmm. much better results, much okay. distorted results. This is gotcha. already well known. Um, you know, you can take a look at the literature. Yes, and again, this is a very messy, if you want to, um, this is a messy analysis. It's kind yeah. of an intro to this, this question. Is, it's been uh, 20, 30 years ago, what individual data was not widely available. So people oftentimes use the aggregator to do regression, but then the differences, the differences Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's thank the speakers.